Well, hello everyone. My name is Kylie and I am the Community Engagement Specialist here at Columbia Springs. And if you haven't been to our site before, I encourage you to visit. It's so beautiful, especially this time of year. And it's just off of Evergreen Highway in Vancouver, Washington. Um, and if you haven't been around Columbia Springs for a little bit, we essentially help tens of thousands of children and their families find belonging in and love for nature. We build a community of lifelong learners and land stewards through our educational opportunities, walking trails, events, and workshops, which are open to all. There really is something for everyone here at Columbia Springs, so I hope that I see you really soon. And to learn more, you can visit our website at www.columbiasprings.org. This is Ben Dittbrenner, and Ben is a freshwater ecologist who is interested in the effects of climate change and human disturbance on stream and wetland ecosystem function. He's always been fascinated by beaver and their ability to modify their environments, and has a PhD from the University of Washington in landscape and aquatic ecology, where he focused on using beaver to restore stream ecosystems. He's also a founder of Beavers Northwest, which is a nonprofit organization with a mission to utilize beaver habitat and restoration and climate adaptation, and recently stepped down as the executive director there, and is now a professor in the Department of Marine Environmental Sciences at Northeastern University in Boston. So lots of things that Ben has been doing for the beavers. Um, so now that you all know a little bit about us, I encourage uh, you to tell us about yourselves. We would love to hear from you in the chat about where you're watching from tonight or anything else that you want to share. And with that, I'll pass it over to Ben. Thanks for being here. All right. Thanks so much, Kylie. And it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really happy to talk about the role of beavers and how they can affect climate resilience, hydrologic resilience and lead to healthier habitats. Uh, along the way, please throw chats, comments, questions into the, the chat box and I'll try to answer those as we're going. So long ago, beaver were really located across a wide swath of North America. Beaver are limited by the food source, basically. And the food sources that they need are cambium, which is woody vegetation. So they extended historically north all the way up to the tundra and south all the way down to deserts. And even some areas of the desert, beaver are pretty uh, prolific in. So they have a really broad range of, um, of of habitats that they can venture into and do well in. And historically, we estimate that before around 1500, there was likely somewhere around 400 million beavers in the North American continent. So that's a, a huge number of animals across North America. So how are they distributed? Beavers are pretty much stuck anywhere where there's water and they prefer wetlands and small streams. So you can see this is a historical wetland map uh, before Europeans started taking wetlands and filling them and, and altering them in certain, certain ways. And you can see that there was a high likelihood that any area that was blue had uh, at least a few colonies, if not thousands or hundreds of thousands of colonies in those areas. So they're re really located all across the landscape and because there's so few beavers now compared to how many there were before they were largely extirpated for most of North America, um, it's hard to imagine what those areas looked like. What did it look like be when beavers kind of reigned across the landscape? Um, in areas where they've come back in high populations, high densities, we can see that they can really transform the landscape and this is likely what it looked like in the Pacific Northwest when beavers were all over the place. You know, there was uh, steps, po step pools uh, winding their way and just dotting the riparian zone from the upper extents of watersheds all the way down to the low lowlands. And these areas were really responsible for trapping lots and lots of water and 
in some cases in areas where that was arid or, or deserty, um, really transforming the landscape from browns to greens. And beavers really had a profound impact in those, those types of areas. Around the 1500s or even a little bit before, before that, there were um, a, a fashion trend that people were wearing fur skin hats. And it became very popular for those fur skin hats to become beaver fur skin hats. And in North America, or in, in Europe, uh, there were, there's another population, another species of beaver called castor fiber. And that species was hunted to near extirpation as well. Extir extirpation just means uh, having local extinction. And so in many areas of Europe, beaver were just hunted until they were hunted and trapped until they just didn't exist in those areas where they existed in really small uh, levels. And when it became economically unfeasible to trap beaver in Europe, people started to eye the North American beaver, Castor canadensis. And the two beaver species are very similar to one another. They're by, if you just looked at them without knowing a lot about beavers, you would think that they were the same type of beaver. So people um, understood their, their habitat needs, understood where they lived. And so it was fairly easy to, to move over towards North America and establish a beaver trapping uh, regime in North America, just as they had done in, in Europe. And as they began to trap, they started uh, in the Northeast and worked their way as beca populations became lower in the Northeast, they worked their way West. And they continue to work their way west until they really started to see dramatic drops in the population. And like many other species in North America, when Europeans began to exploit those species, they thought that the number of individuals was essentially limitless. And in fairly short order, it turned out that those populations were susceptible to decline and, and near extinction. So between the mid 1500s to about 1900, widespread trapping across off all of North America led to almost no beaver in the contiguous United States. And really, so you may have heard that some people may have said, uh, or you may have heard somewhere that there were just no beaver and we had to bring them from Canada. That's not exactly accurate. There were still beaver, but it, they were in just such low numbers that it wasn't really pop possible to economically trap beavers on the landscape. So really by around 1900, the beaver trade started to just dry up. There just wasn't enough beavers. And around that time, the, the fashion trends in Europe started to shift and there was no longer a huge demand for that beaver fur. So after that, really the, the demand and the, the beaver trade kind of shifted. Uh, there was still some trapping happening but after that, um, there was really kind of a cessation of trapping and beavers started to return in some cases. Um, but in the meantime, people had found that those areas that beavers had been occupying, those big wetland systems, um, had been really doing a lot of stuff on the landscape. That, and namely, uh, for people who were moving west to start up homesteads, they found that those beaver ponds had been a grading sediment, collecting really, really great sediment. And once those wetlands were drained, those areas were just prime time uh, areas for, for raising crops. So once beavers started to come back to some of those areas, there were conflicts that started to arise. And so a number of different federal agencies were tasked with pretty much systematically surveying uh, various streams and wetland systems and making sure that beavers weren't coming back and then trapping if they were. So there was a, a systematic trapping uh, system going in many areas and trapping out beavers from the mid 1900s all the way through the 70s and even today that's happening to some degree. And beavers, even despite some of this um, widespread trapping, the systematic trapping that I was talking about, uh, have been returning to certain areas and really kind of um, forging back into places and starting to repopulate. 
And this is shown even in a, a study that we did in 2019, we went and surveyed uh, all of the blue lines, all of the water, all of the stream sections within the city of Seattle. We walked all streams and we looked for signs of beaver. And we found that there was really surprisingly either historical sign or active sign, meaning um, dam building or foraging or other types of browse throughout most of the city of Seattle. And, and we were surprised to see that there was way higher densities than we thought was even possible. So even in, in a really, really urban area, beaver have been coming back. And so we were really curious as to what might be driving some of those um, trends. And really there's just been an, a decrease in the, um, the overall interest in trapping. And in 2001, I'm going to back up for a second here. In 2001, there was a, a bill passed in the state of Washington and an outlawed body group in traps. And that really had a profound impact on the trapping trade. And ever since then, we saw population or the trapping population go from about 5,000 beavers a year down to about 500 beavers a year. So an uh, order of magnitude decrease in trapping really across the state really um, corresponded to kind of an explosion of beaver on the landscape. And we've really seen them in coming back to areas like the Puget Sound lowlands, places where the climate is relatively mild and there's lots of vegetation, at least in areas that aren't heavily uh, modified by humans. And beavers seem to do well, even despite some um, active and kind of heavy land use in certain areas. So as beavers are coming back onto the landscape, we have seen them causing problems in some cases and creating opportunities in other cases. So it seems like everyone has a feeling about beavers. Uh, if you surveyed people, no one just has a meh feeling about beaver. Everyone has some sort of kind of strong feeling. Um, some people, think that beavers are devilish for the flooding that they create. Other beavers think that they're saints for the restoration potential that they create. Um, some think that they're an evil villain because they potentially create fish barriers, which by the way, they don't. Um, and last but not least, others think that beavers could be climate heroes for all of the, the things that I'm about to talk about right now. However you feel about them, you, it is, true that they do some amazing stuff in the landscape and that's what I'm going to focus on today. So we call it beavers ecosystem engineers because they actively modify their landscape to try to make the habitat area more preferable for their needs. And beavers just like humans are really, we too are the largest ecosystem engineers on the planet. Um, after humans, beavers really are the king when it comes to the the non-human animal world at modifying and changing the landscape in really dramatic, dramatic ways. So some of the things that they do uh, by building the dams, they slow down that water. And once that water starts slowing down, it starts spreading out across the landscape. And as it does that, it starts to create uh, complexity. It starts to be become more messy. Um, when that water is slow, water is always carrying some amount of sediment. And when that water slows down, the sediment that's in the water column starts to, to fall out, to precipitate. And over time, that precipitation of certainly build up the, the bed of the stream. And it will eventually continue to rise and the beavers will build their dam higher. And that will happen over and over again. Then areas that may have been uh, heavily incised because of high velocity, streams, those areas are able to reconnect with their floodplains. Um, and, and by doing that, it spreads that water back out into the riparian zone and it connects all the, the riparian vegetation, tree species and other things, and leads to a healthier riparian area. Along those same lines, that those dams slow water down and allow that water to be stored uh, before it just runs all the way down to the outlet of those streams. And it's stored in both the surface, what we can see in this picture here, but also in the subsurface, in the groundwater. And one of the things we'll talk about here is in this talk is thermal heterogeneity. Beavers are basically 
taking a stream where the, the temperature of the stream might be pretty consistent from the top to the bottom. Uh, and it's creating pools, it's creating deep spots, it's creating shallow spots, it's creating fringe spots, and all those different areas heat up differentially. And because there's different thermal regimes, species who are either like cold water or warm water will, will be able to partition themselves and find the areas that they like the best, which leads to healthier and happier creatures and stronger bonds in the food web. Okay, so what happens in ecosystems, well, I kind of already, cat has, has gotten out of the bag. Um, there's just all this diversity in the types of uh, phenomena happening in the processes of those ecosystems. And that complexity leads to more different types of habitat. And if there's more types of habitat, there's higher levels of biodiversity. And as we see more levels of biodiversity, we see more resilience within those ecological communities. So beavers are directly creating biodiversity and higher levels of resilience in many places that they, they enter. So their resurgence on the landscape is, has been leading to a lot of really great things on the landscape. But at the same time, we have been seeing pretty dramatic changes on the landscape in the other direction. And that here, what we're talking about, is climate change. And climate change has the potential to cause major alterations to hydrology and temperature across the Northwest and pretty much all of the, the world. So this is an example of a hydrograph in the city of Goldbar on the Skykomish River. Hydrograph basically is a graph that measures the amount of water flowing at a given point in a stream over time. And so here, this is a historical hydrograph. And basically we're starting in October on the x-axis. So this is the hydrologic year. So it starts in October, October, November, December. And then in on the y-axis, we're looking at discharge. So the amount of water that's flowing uh, at the city of Gold Bar across the, the gauge that's collecting this. And so we can see a fairly uh, predictable uh, situation happening in this figure. So in October, we see that the, the river is flowing and flow in the river starts to increase. The reason for that is simply that we start to have rain in October. So we get rain and we see an increase of stream flow in the river, so that's no surprise. But uh, anyone who lives in Washington knows that the rain does not stop in December. So this, this hydrograph shows that there's this peak and the water levels actually, the discharge is going down. What's actually happening is that we continue to get precipitation, but that precipitation is falling as snow instead of rain. And so that snow is locked in the watershed um, and the water level is going down because there's just no liquid water that's driving the stream flow. That trend continues throughout the winter and then till we get to about March. And in between March and April, we see a warming and some of the snow that's falling in now begins to transition to precipitate or to, to rain. And we start to see some snow melt happening at the same time. And right around then we see that the hydrograph is starting to go up as water starts trickling down to streams. And then those streams are feeding the main stems of rivers. And we see in April, May, June, the beginning of the peak. And that peak goes through May, June, and maybe even July and then slowly tapers through July and August. So really uh, the precipitation, like heavy precipitation is really done somewhere around June, at least we hope. Um, and so most of this part of this hydrograph, the stream flow is really coming from snowmelt at that time. So snowmelt in the Northwest is really important for maintaining and supplementing streams during summer. So in the summertime, uh, it's really the most vulnerable time for a lot of aquatic organisms. That's when the water level is going down. There's less water in the streams, which means that the water can heat up faster. And uh, warmer water holds less oxygen. And since all aquatic organisms are breathers of oxygen, uh, less oxygen means that they are potentially imperiled. So they're always hoping to find areas with lots of oxygen, and that usually means lots of water. Okay, so that was the historic hydrograph. 
Now with climate change, we have some expectations and some observations that we've already been seeing. Uh, we are expecting and I already have seen some degree of warming in the Northwest, and we're expecting to see an increase of up to eight degrees annual warming in certain places, especially at higher elevations. Because it will be warmer, we're expecting to see way less summer precipitation, but also more winter precipitation since the warmer weather will allow that air to uh, absorb more water during the, the winter time and carry that water from the ocean towards the coast and then dump that as it hits the Cascades. So since we're seeing a 30% decrease in the summer, but a 14% annual increase, that means that a lot of that precipitation falling in the winter or in the summertime will shift to the, to the winter. And then on top of that, we'll see more. So we'll see a lot more water, but just not in the summertime when we really need it. So projections for 2080 show a pretty dramatic shift in what the hydrograph should look like. So the red line now is what we're expecting the Skycomish River at Gold Bar to look like by 2080. And what's happening here is we are seeing, instead of a gradual increase in stream flow, a really dramatic increase in stream flow as we're getting all of that precipitation in the beginning of fall and through the late fall and early, early winter time. And then because we're seeing warmer temperatures, especially at higher elevations, we're expecting to see much less snowpack. Uh, so all that water or all that precipitation that's falling is liquid, or, uh, is, as snow before now is falling is liquid water and that water is going straight out to the Puget Sound. So there's much less opportunity for that water to be held the snowpack and maintained or preserved until spring and hopefully even in summer. And so we can see, instead of having this bimodal peak where we have a peak and then storage and then another peak in stream flow, we actually see a pretty dramatic decrease in stream flow all the way through July, bottoming out at a much lower levels in August. And so we're expecting to see increasing intensity uh, having an effect on things like uh, the salmon reds. So the eggs, egg masses that the, the salmon are depositing in streams, those will have the potential to be scoured out it went during a heavy stream flow. More scouring of the bed of streams and potentially floodplains as well. In terms of the precipitation, um, inundation and sometimes, but also in the summertime with less water, things like drying of trees, increased tree, tree, tree stress, and as a result, things like in, increases in fire probability. And then with less snow melt, we're expecting to see lower base flows, which means just the amount of water during summer stream flow and potentially elevated stream temperatures and for cold water fishes and other organisms potentially lethal stream temperatures. And then certain areas will likely transition from perennially, so always flowing streams, to seasonally flowing streams, which restricts the habitat potential for certain organisms. Uh, other things such as phenology, which is the timing of species, migration, competition, resilience, and other ecological uh, phenomena uh, are just much more complicated and much more difficult to kind of tease apart and predict what will happen in some of those cases. Okay, so enter left sage beavers. So beavers are really phenomenal for a, a whole lot of reasons, but they've recently got a lot of attention for some of the really great things that they do that are related to climate change. So Beavers can do things like by building dams and streams, they can buffer those peak storm events by just slowing that water down. By slowing it down, that also has a potential to increase water storage, that has a potential to go down into the ground to increase groundwater. And then that groundwater slowly comes back out of the, the ground uh, throughout the year. And so that reemergence of that water has the potential to increase summer base flow, in, especially in areas that have been dramatically affected. So there's a lot of uh, hope that beaver have the potential to really influence systems and create some sort of uh, climate resilience, increased resilience uh, or refugia. And people have been studying beaver because they're just been so fascinating for, for basically uh, over, over a century. Um, and so we have a lot of data from various studies to predict what happens with beavers. 
And despite all of that information, we still are a little bit fuzzy on exactly how they affect systems uh, in various um, modalities or in, in certain circumstances in certain areas as spatially and things like that. So this figure just shows um, how different trends from studies have shown various uh, results. So for example, for temperature, uh, warming and cooling. Um, and so broad disagreement with certain, uh, certain questions. So that triggered me to really think about whether beaver were helping the system, whether they could be uh, used to offset some of the, the losses that we would see in, in water storage, and also how that they can affect stream temperature and whether across the landscape they can have meaningful effects on stream temperature. So really the questions were, can beavers be used as restor agents, restoration agents to influence water storage and stream temperature? And on top of that, um, is that just a effect that we see in a very limited uh, scale or can they really impact uh, climate change and reduce some of those those negative impacts. Okay, so the first thing that we want to set out to do is to characterize habitat and population levels in our in our area. Then we relocated beavers into headwater streams. And, and last week you we talked about relocation. We'll dive into that a little bit, but we're going to focus on the results here. And then number three are those results to evaluate the hydrologic and temperature effects of relocated beaver. So our, our study basin that we did all, most of our work in was the Skykomish River Basin. And we were really interested in this basin because it has a lot of characteristics that are representative of much of the Cascades. It has all five species of salmon. It has a variety of land use types and it has a variety of topographic and um, ecotypes within the area. So it really is a, a great place to, to evaluate how beavers are affecting the basin. And so we wanted to, or th there has been some really interesting methodologies for relocation over, over, the, over the course of, of uh, beaver studies. And uh, unfortunately, we were not able to utilize the preferred method, which is to parachute beavers into the target basin uh, so that's the easiest way to do it. Um, and this is actually a real thing. So in the 40s, some people in Idaho identified uh, the Frank Church Wilderness as having uh, really no beavers. And they, they accurately identified the loss of ecosystem function as a result of the extirpation of beavers in those areas. So they relocated beaver by air, air mailing them into the, the Frank Church Wilderness. And they monitored the presence of beaver and some beaver stuck. There was, uh, I think, like pretty minimal mortality and beaver successfully colonized those area once they were dropped in. And there are still beaver from those original relocations there today. So pretty cool. Um, the, the permitting on this is a nightmare. So that never uh, panned out. So we had to do it the, the uh, less fun, but more traditional way. Um, so we identified areas in the lower Puget Sound where there were landowners who had beaver problems and they were likely going to trap and remove those beavers lethally. And we worked with those landowners to allow us to move in and set up a trapping uh, regime in those areas. And we removed uh, quite a few beavers. And this is an example of uh, uh, the, the trap that we used. And so this is a spring-loaded suitcase trap. Uh, we used various lures and you put the lure on the top of the trap and the, the trigger is just below the water line and beavers come in, they've got a really great sense of smell and they're really curious creatures. And so at nighttime, they'll come out and they can smell this smell and they'll come in and investigate. And as they swim up, their paw will touch the trigger as they're swimming up like this and that triggers it and the whole thing scoops the beaver out onto the land. Uh, and then we had satellite transceivers that would trigger as soon as the, the trap closed and it would let us know that there were likely a beaver in the trap. And then we would 
get out there as soon as we could to retrieve that animal and process it. Um, so we started trapping in 2014 and we went through 2017 and the Tulalip tribes who are partnered with have continued to trap and they're still trapping now and, and relocating beavers uh, even as we speak. Uh, we focused in King and Snohomish counties and we captured over 100 beavers to date and that number continues to go up. Here is a video of a beaver family. This is a really big beaver family that we uh, went out and trapped. And I think that there were seven individuals in the colony. And so we, we caught this guy, this is a big brother. Uh, and then we caught this girl, the sister, the, the next day. We, we caught the entire family, luckily, uh, and relocated that family together. So once we catch individuals, when we bring them back to a handling facility, um, in some cases, some restoration or relocation crews will take beavers and relocate them immediately once they catch them. Um, we found, and through the literature, there's ample evidence to suggest there's higher site fidelity if you relocate the entire colony. And so that's what we, we really tried to do. So when we brought beavers in, we would weigh them, uh, we would take blood samples, we would take DNA, we would uh, put ear tags on so we could identify which beavers were what. And uh, in some cases we use, use telemetry, which is a tracking, and we would also do uh, sex determination to identify which uh, beavers were male and female. Once we had those individuals processed, then we would put them in a facility to hold those beavers. And these are really just simply salmon raceways uh, for raising salmon, and we would cr construct two kind of makeshift uh, lodges in each of the, the raceways. And if we caught a family, we would we'd put them in there and they generally would just all jump into the, to the, to the lodges. And they're really, really social animals, so they just get in there and make a big beaver pile and uh, are, are happy that once they're kind of hidden away and it can have a little bit of um, cover for themselves. In cases where we found an individual beaver, uh, we would try to pair that individual beaver with another individual beaver so that we could relocate them as a, a couple. And so the first step in that process was to see if the, the beavers liked each other. So we would put them into the raceway and after a couple days they were sleeping in separate lodges, we would know that they weren't really into each other if after a couple of days they were sleeping in the same lodge, then we would know that they, they liked each other and we would go ahead and, and do the relocation together. So as it turns out, um, this isn't the case for every other restoration crew that we've, we know about, but for our, our, <laughs> our uh, trapping and restoration or relocation, it turned out that every single one of our beavers that we paired were into each other and so I'm not sure if it was just uh, the luck of the draw or if beavers have really low standards, but it turned out that at least uh, in our study, all of the beavers fell in love almost instantly. So we, we were very happy about that. Um, so once we had a colony uh, that was ready to go, we would prep a site that we had previously identified as being a high quality beaver habitat, but lacking any, any sign or any, any active beaver presence. And then we would relocate those beavers out to those areas. Um, when we did that, or right before we did that, we would build a temporary beaver lodge, which was just kind of like a little log cabin that had a bunch of brush over the top. And relocating them into the beaver lodge allowed them to have a little bit of reduction in stress because they have where they were released kind of away from people. Um, it reduced the potential for predation and increased the likelihood that they would stay there, so the site fidelity. They didn't really stay within the lodge always, but they did periodically use it. So we found that it was useful even if it wasn't used all the time. So we were really interested in seeing what the beaver building, beaver damming, what the impacts would be, what the effect would be on the, those areas. And so we designed a, a, a sampling protocol using a Baki fram, framework. So Baki means before, after control impact. And so what that really means is before we do any sort of uh, release, we find two different streams, one that 
they both looking like each other. One is a control and the other one would be our release stream. And then we equip that stream with uh, temperature loggers and groundwater wells so that we can measure groundwater levels. And we measure those sites for at least a year before anything is done, just to see what those systems look like before beavers are relocated into those areas. Following relocation, we go back and the control site is never touched. So that remains a control both before and after, but the release site gets beaver relocated into it. And we monitor that site for that next year and then uh, in subsequent years and potentially put in additional uh, instrumentation in the areas that they're really going to town and to, to try to tease out what sort of impacts that they're having there. So here's a couple of uh, scenarios that that happened. Um, so in this is one of our sites, it's called the Foss Road site. And in 2014, we released a family of beavers there. And we thought it was a really great looking site, but they didn't agree with us. And they, they headed for the hills and they went into the Foss River main stem and they were out of there. So um, we, we don't know where they went, but they did not stay there. So we were still confident that the site was good. So in 2015, we released another colony of, I think it was six beavers, and they took to the stream instantaneously. They really liked it, and they started building within a few days. And so this is a, an aerial of the, the section of stream that we were interested in. And over the course of a, a couple of years, they transformed the site uh, pretty substantially. So these, these uh, ovals are places where they, they built dams. So this is a drone imagery that we collected in the winter during leaf off. So it's often easier to collect winter imagery when there's no leaves on the trees, but you can also differentiate the streams when there's snow on the banks. And so we had beaver, uh, so the lodge, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse on the screen, but the lodge was uh, right up here, I think right there. Um, and they built four different dams and they slowly built those dams and they continued to build onto those dams as water levels went up. And so before release, the, the green lines or the green polygons show what the, the extent of water in those areas. And then in, by 2016, so after a year, the water was expanding. Um, and by 2017, it was really extending out into these peripheral areas where there had never been really any sign of water creating all of this really cool uh, kind of back water habitat. So stuff that was especially really useful for like amphibians and other things where uh, it might not be permanently flooded, but it's a great place for amphibians to lay eggs and then it dries out in the summertime potentially. Um, and so here's some images of what the site looked like. And, and this is the biggest pond part. Um, it's really cool. They just built this giant bathtub. And so the, the dam goes out and then you can see it kind of disappears off into the, the upper right corner. So it just goes on and on and on. So really like just great little habitat um, basically coming out of nowhere. Okay, so what, what did we see happen over that period of time? Um, so in 2015, before we released the, the surface water volume of that reach that we were looking at was about 35, 100 square meters and after it had tripled up to 9,000 square meters in terms of volume, it went from about 1,000 square meters or uh, uh, cubic meters up to six or almost 7,000 cubic meters. So it multiplied by seven. Uh, so a pretty dramatic increase in the surface water volume. When we expanded this out to look at all of the different sites, uh, overall, with the, all of the relocation that we did, we saw that there was an increase of uh, over five sites that were successful and long-term successful. Uh, 19 ponds or 19 dams were constructed and ponds formed behind them. And we saw, not surprisingly, within those areas, a really dramatic increase in the amount of water stored within each of those reaches. And so basically about a 22 times as much storage in the relocation reaches after um, beavers have become established in those areas. So really phenomenal amounts of, of uh, surface water. So that wasn't super surprising. Um, the big unknown was what beavers were doing 
it with groundwater. And so there are some studies out there that have looked at beavers and groundwater, but there really wasn't anything that looked at beavers uh, and how they affect groundwater uh, following re relocation and how quickly they affect groundwater. And so we found that within each reach, beavers were having about two and a half times as much uh, groundwater storage as they were having a surface water storage. So this was finally a metric that was really kind of um, something that we were waiting to, to see and, and looking for and something that people often talk a lot about but don't have actual numbers to put behind it. So uh, we were pretty impressed by just the, the really fast increase of storage that was happening in those areas. Okay, so what are beavers doing with, with temperature? So the mechanism that we assume to be taking place with uh, stream cooling from beavers is that when beavers come into an area, they build a dam and that dam creates a pond. And as the water level goes up, that, that water is really heavy and it forces the water, it pushes it down into the ground. And the ambient temperature of the ground is much cooler than the air. And so that warm or relatively warm surface water once it goes down into the ground, will start to cool down and it slowly trickles, seeps through the ground. And at some point there's a uh, area of, of low hydraulic pressure, which just means that um, the water pushing the groundwater from above it is pushing it um, and it wants to come out. So it expresses itself out and it starts to push that cool water out and that that supplements the warmer surface water and it thereby cools down the stream. So this is the mechanism we're expecting to see. And so here's an example uh, of a site that we uh, instrumented pretty heavily. Uh, this is Highway 2 going up to, to the, the, the past. And uh, so this, this is a stream system in a big wetland. The stream comes in and uh, well, first I'll set this up too. This is uh, a temperature graph. And so on the x-axis is time. So we're looking at the 2015 summer um, going from July through September. And then he, over on the y-axis, this is uh, temperature in Celsius. And these, these blue and dark lines, black lines, are the temperature over time. So in this upper area, this, this, we have a temperature logger here. This part of the stream was not influenced by beaver at all. And we saw pretty much a standard temperature throughout most of the hottest part of, of the summer. It was about 14 degrees Celsius. The water flowed into this big old wetland here. And this was a pretty shallow wetland. And so we expected to see some degree of warming. The midpoint of this wetland here uh, corresponds to this uh, more coarsely dotted line. And the temperature was somewhere around uh, 20 degrees to 22 degrees. So this is like bathtub water. This is, this is water that's uh, not preferable to most species, especially salmonids. Uh, and then when we looked, so the, the wetland continues on and there's a big giant beaver dam right here. And we have an, another temperature logger at the surface of this open water. And we can see a pretty hot surface water temperature right here. When we move beyond the beaver dam downstream, just underneath the, the road. Um, there's another temperature logger there. And that temperature logger really surprisingly to us showed a dramatic decrease in stream temperature. So going from basically bathtub temperatures at the surface of this pond, all the way down to about nine degrees Celsius. So this is freezing cold water. I think that's, I can't even speculate what that is in Fahrenheit, but it's really cold water. It's total refugia for, for species that like cold water. Um, so this really exemplifies the dramatic cooling effect that these dams can have. Um, and I should just mention that um, it was, this water was really warm, but there definitely was enough depth here that the, the, the bottom of this, this pond was nice and cool. So there was definitely places where species could just sit and hold for the summertime and just hang out until things became a, a little bit less stressful. Okay, so moving beyond uh, just individual sites and looking at how relocated beaver affected stream temperature across the board, we measured uh, stream temperature it, by comparing how temperature changed 
from a reference point above where the beaver were to a reference point below where the beaver were. So we're tracking change over, over this a distance. And so what we're really looking for here is, uh, so this is, this is a figure of a box plot of beaver temperature and the amount of change that's happening in the stream here. So if we see uh, positive numbers, we, that means that there was an increase in temperature from the top of the site to the bottom of the site, which means that the dam was likely causing an increase of temperature. If we see a decrease in temperature, there's a cooling effect from the top of the site to the bottom of the site. So before we relocated Beaver, this is uh, all of the, the temperatures that we found, the daily temperatures and all the, the systems that we were studying. And it had basically a median temperature of just above zero. So there was a, a very, very slight warming effect when no, none of the beaver were, were relocated yet. Following relocation, we saw a pretty dramatic change happen. We saw that the temperature on the median temperature, so kind of on average, um, decreased substantially. And there were all of those hot temperatures that we saw pr prior to relocation, they all fell to cooling temperatures. So not only did we see an average decrease in the temperature, we also saw a dramatic decrease in the hot uh, warming effects that we saw. So both things were really, really promising and pointed towards, at least in the Cascades, some really positive benefits of having beaver in those area. So overall, there was a, on average, 2.3 degree decrease or cooling effect by putting beavers in those systems. So that's, that's because this is an average, that's a really meaningful number. So we also looked at more than just um, relocation sites. So the relocation sites that we just looked at is uh, on this chart is this release category, but we also had all those controls that we looked at. We had relics uh, ponds. So those were beaver ponds that were uh, once long ago abandoned, and now they kind of look like bathtubs. We have relic complexes, which are big beaver systems that were long abandoned, and now they looked like a bunch of kind of beavery bathtubs, but much more complex. And then well-established beaver systems where these are systems where beavers have been for a long time, and that, that's really um, highly complex, lots of dams, lots of things going on. Interestingly enough, uh, the control, well, this is no surprise, we saw a slight warming effect. So the, if there was no beaver in streams, um, as you move from upstream to downstream, we saw an overall warming effect. And that's consistent with what people expect to see. Uh, really interestingly, the, in our relic streams, those areas that were uh, the shallow ponds where beavers had abandoned them long ago, uh, but the system still persists. So maybe those were 50 years ago, 20 years ago, it's hard to say. Uh, those systems, we saw a pretty dramatic increase in temperatures. And so the median temperature was even greater warming effect and control. But if you look at all of these, these high temperatures, um, beyond just the median, there was examples of a 10 degree Celsius increase in temperature within those sites. So those were really contributing to warming and potentially um, threatening species dramatically. Um, interestingly though, so when we look at the relic complexes, so similar system, but just much more complex, those were actually having a cooling effect. So that, that was not expected. Uh, and then our established systems, beaver were pretty much having the same effect as release. So the really interesting takeaway there is that we ex expected that beaver in these really long established systems were having some really good benefits. We did not expect to see that beaver that were relocated um, that year were creating cooling effects equivalent to systems that were maybe 20 or even more years old. So that, that was really surprising and uh, uh, happily surprising. Okay, so I forgot to show you guys these pictures. So this is what a relic complex looks like. So just kind of a, a shallow bathtub of a wetland system. And then this is a, a, a relic, uh, sorry, this is regular relic and this is the relic complex. So it looks like beavers are active, but these are just a system where there's evidence of a dam, but it has been maintained and it's really just completely porous throughout the entire thing. Uh, Judy, thanks for the nine degrees is 40, nine degrees Celsius, 48 degrees. 
So yeah, that's that's really cool. Okay, conclusion. So wrapping it up, um, we we saw things that we were expecting. We saw some things that we weren't expecting. So uh, one of the things where that reach scale hydrologic goals can be met quickly. So an example of this is that we were seeing this dramatic cooling happening almost instantaneously after beaver were coming in there. That's something that we were really hoping to see, but not something that we were expecting to see. Um, the next thing, beaver or stream, stream scale goals uh, easily within reach. So we're hoping that uh, relocating beavers, so, you know, as a side note, relocating beavers is not something that we can do systematically across an entire watershed to repopulate the watershed. What we're hoping to do is take beaver, relocate them to, to core habitat that's really high quality, let them become well-established, and then let those viable colonies start making more colonies by uh, sending out their, their offspring to go colonize new areas. And so if we're seeing those dramatic increases at the reach scale, which means, or sorry, at the, the uh, yeah, the reach scale, which is just the, a you know, 100 meter section of stream or something, we are pretty confident that we will see larger stream scale goals. So maybe not, no longer 100 meters, but like a thousand meters or even more uh, dramatic cooling effects and storage effects in those areas as well. Um, another takeaway is that, even though there is a high level of, of uh, institutional cost and just fiscal cost and also uh, manpower cost, this is dramatically less expensive than doing um, widespread restoration across an entire stream system. And it's just not even politically or logistically feasible to do that. So beavers are offering a relocation option that just doesn't actually exist uh, if we were trying to do it ourselves. Uh, and the timing here is obviously perfect. The, the snowpack is decreasing on a yearly basis. We're tracking this. It's following what we expect to see. Uh, it's, it's alarming, uh, no doubt about that. Um, so identifying novel restoration techniques, whether that be beaver or anything else that seems like a good idea, um, this needs to be implemented now. And so we can just be ahead of the game or as, or as much as we can be. Um, so one really interesting thing that we identified was this differential in the temperature effects between systems that are small uh, and then systems that are large. And it really gave us kind of a, a restoration directive. And that directive was that if we in certain areas are identifying the, the primary problem with streams to be a temperature problem, we're seeing that really hot temperatures, well then we can relocate beavers into those areas that are like those little bathtub areas. So target those small ponds to reduce temperature. And then in areas where we wanna see a lot more storage, we wanna see that groundwater storage, we wanna see that groundwater recharge, uh, we can target larger complexes to put beavers in those areas. They don't have to be mutually ex exclusive, but understanding the, the value and the potential effect by putting the beavers in those different areas allows us to, to tweak how we approach that restoration paradigm. Um, we have been surprised to not see beaver in certain places that we thought would be really just obvious places to find beaver. So we have theories, but we're still uncertain why beaver are not in certain areas that we've relocated them to already. Um, the, we're happy that once we relocate them, we see that they, in most cases, are staying there and building, or in many cases, I don't wanna say most cases, um, but it's surprising that they're not in some of those areas. So there's, there's a lot of theories on that, uh, but there, it hasn't really been untangled. And it's likely probably uh, a culmination of a bunch of factors that come together to create um, some barriers for, for expansion of the population across certain areas. Um, and then, um, so we've been talking and a lot of people are talking about how beavers are a potential ace in the hole for climate change, uh, but we can't forget that beavers themselves are potentially threatened by climate change. So beavers need water, they need perennial stream flow. And so if we get to a point where we do see stream, stream flow going from perennial to seasonal, any of those reaches where beavers might've been viable are now no longer 
a possibility in those areas. So uh, even though Beaver may be part of the, the puzzle and part of the solution, they will definitely be affected by climate change as well. Uh, final thoughts, uh, doing beaver relocation is a really great way to do restoration. Uh, the general population gets excited about it. Um, it really can serve to help people understand the process and understand the value and understand how all of these various creatures are, are interacting with one another and the value of all those things. Um, so, so this methodology is something that we've seen expanding across the landscape of Washington. Uh, and I'm really excited to see that there's a whole bunch of uh, relocation and restoration programs uh, flourishing right now. And I expect to see some, some great stuff come out of that. So thank you all for listening. Uh, and I'd like to thank my team uh, who all came together to do some really amazing beaver relocation work. Uh, and so with that, I will take questions. Thank you so much, Ben. Really, I mean, the groundwater part, I hadn't even thought about that. So super interesting talk. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> it looks like we have a couple of questions here. Um, if you want to stick around for a couple minutes, of course, if you anybody has to go, they're welcome to leave. Um, but let's see, one here. Uh, what first got you interested in studying beaver? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't know if I can actually answer it. I've always been interested in beaver. I'm from Wisconsin and there's a lot of beaver there. And so there's a lot of opportunities to see streams with dams. And once you've walked a stream and seen the, the power of beaver and how they can modify stream systems, it's, it's just really um, captivating. And as an ecologist, it's something that it's pretty hard to ignore. So I've always been interested in them. Um, I took a job with Snohomish County and part of that role there was to do uh, modification of beaver dams and working with um, the roads crew to identify ways to persist with beaver non-lethally. And that just started to lay the groundwork of my interest in, in utilizing beaver as a restoration tool. So after that, it was, it was all downhill from there. <laughs> downhill or uphill, yeah. whichever. <laughs> Maybe downstream, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, and there you go, there you go. Um, so here's one that I hear pretty often too. Uh, are beaver dams good for salmon? Can they actually get past them? Yeah, so beaver, uh, beaver ponds are really great for salmon. Um, number one, they create that cold water or hold cold water during the summertime. And in some cases, that's the only cold water in that section of the stream. Beyond that, by having ponds with all these different types of substrate on the bottom, different types of depths, different types of thermal regimes, they allow all of these different types of benthic organisms to the, the level of, of abundance is increased, the diversity is increased. And so benthic invertebrates are, are just the creepy crawly things that in their, their larval form live underwater on, on the bed of the stream or, or, or lake, but then they hatch out and you know them as mayflies or caddisflies or mosquitoes or midges or whatever. Uh, those guys are really the basis of the food web for salmon. So these systems that are increasing the number of those guys and the diversity means that there are more of those guys available and there's the timing of them is broader. So the food source is not just greater, but it's also available throughout the entire year rather than like during peak periods. In terms of how beaver uh, affect salmon migration, the, the dams do definitely create blockages periodically. And, and there's no there's no ways about that. Um, but if you look at, on average, beaver dams do not create fish passage barriers. That's reflected, you know, when you might have heard anecdotes where people say, you know, when when uh, Europeans came to the Northwest, they could walk across the Columbia River on the backs of salmon. You know, there was a million beaver here, and there was an uncountable number of salmon. 
and they definitely were not causing problems for one another. So the proof is in the pudding there. Um, in terms of how beaver can move through uh, beaver, or sorry, in, in terms of how salmon can move through beaver dams, it's pretty interesting. Um, in some cases, you might not see it, but during high flows, the water level will be high enough that it'll actually overtop the dam and beaver or salmon can sometimes swim right over the top of the dam. In other cases, uh, salmon, especially things like coho are really uh, evolved with, with salmon and they can find little rivulets to either jump over or squiggle up through. In some cases, I've talked to fish biologists and they literally find salmon wedged into the dam and they, they wedge themselves in and they hang out there. And then when they're ready to move and they just rest. And then when they're ready to move, they literally squiggle through the, through the structure and they come out the other end. And so they can literally push their way through the dam itself. Um, so there's, it, it looks impenetrable to, to us, uh, but to salmon, it's just part of their, their life history. Yeah, super interesting. Um, and that kind of relates to another one here about how might we look to beaver dams in our own construction? I wonder, I wonder if there are any parallels there that we could think about. Well, yeah, so I don't have a great answer for that, but I can tell you one really interesting thing is, so I, I went with an AmeriCorps crew and there was a beaver dam that somebody pulled out and we, the landowner wanted it back. So we built mm -hmm. a beaver dam, which I thought was gonna be really fun. But we traditionally just think of building a, a dam by putting sticks across the, the, the stream. But what beaver do is they don't do that at all. They take sticks and push them into the, the substrate, into the bed facing upstream. And then they start weaving sticks together and then they pack, and basically it makes a matrix, a uh, shell, and then they, they take mud from the bottom of the pond and they pack it in there to, to make it watertight. So beaver um, have been doing this for a long time and it's sometimes, uh, it's not totally uh, logical to us, but it actually is, is pretty ingenious how, how they build those systems, build those dams. Super cool. Okay, we have one last one here. What has been your favorite beaver encounter? Uh, so that's, that's a hard question because I have a lot of different beaver encounters um, in a lot of categories. But I guess one really cool one is um, beaver do not make a lot of noise. They're, they're pretty quiet. Um, when you trap a beaver and you approach the, the trap, they'll often hiss at you because they're really, really scared. Uh, so that just seems pretty normal. But once you get there uh, and you put a blanket over them and bring them back to a facility and even pull them out to, to work on them a little bit, they don't make a noise. They seem really calm. They're, they're really gentle creatures. Um, we trapped a, a big family and I think it was, I want to say it was nine individuals, but it was, it was a lot of beavers. So it was the, the mating pair. It was the, it was, I think it was three juveniles and maybe three. So they were like the, the one-year-olds and then uh, three kits. So just the babies. And it was early in the season. So the, the babies were just little tiny guys, just tiny little teddy bears, super, super cute. And we, we had all of them and we had them for a long time because in the, in our facility, because they, we we're just trying to get this giant colony. It was taking us a long time to catch them. We finally caught them. We took them up to go release them. We released all of them into this giant lodge that we built. And we, we walked away and you could hear them all just squeaking to each other inside the lodge. And you just could tell, I mean, I don't speak beaver, but I could just tell that they were so relieved to just be back in nature and that whole stressful event was behind them and they were all together and it was just made me feel like uh, I was doing the right thing. So it was a really awesome experience. Yeah, oh, warms my heart. <laughs> okay, I think those are our questions for tonight. So thank you all for joining us and thank you, Ben, for the amazing talk. So, so fun to hear those stories um and i think i'll let you log off and enjoy the rest of your night i know it's late there <laughs> it is but this was really fun so thanks so much for having me oh of course great to see you <laughs> bye bye now bye